Hi guys, how you doing? My name is Nikki. I'm a state park interpreter here on the Mendocino coast. Everyone look down at the bottom of your screen. There's an option where you can raise your hand and say hello or respond when I answer questions. Everyone raise your hand if you can find that button. All right, we're gonna make sure everyone's logging in and getting into this program all right. Thank you guys for raising your hands. There's also an option to lower your hand so that your hand's not raised the whole time, but you can answer questions when I ask you. So make sure you lower your hand back down after you lift it up. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for being here. Again, my name is Nikki. I'm an interpreter here on the Mendocino Coast. It is a beautiful day today, and I'm so excited to have you here coming to me virtually and learning about our amazing ecosystem here, the kelp forest. And did you know that there's many ecosystems just connected onshore? I'm going to give you guys a little brief tour of where I'm at. This is Van Dam State Beach, which just offshore is connecting and a part of Van Dam SMCA which is a state marine conservation area. One of 124 marine protected areas. As you can see, the tide's a little low. The ocean is beautiful blue color today. Thank you for staying healthy at home and listening to your health officials of your district to keep your community, your friends, and your family safe during this strange time. We're gonna be learning about the kelp forest ecosystem, how it's threatened, why it's threatened, and why keystone species play a crucial role in helping this ecosystem, and how the loss of keystone species could be catastrophic. So as you can see, probably as I turn the camera, what do you observe? What are some things you observe on this beach? Oh, before I get started, before we answer those questions, let's talk about what you might need for this program. So if you guys can grab a pen and paper, maybe a paper to draw on and some coloring pencils or some colors, um, that would be very helpful. And so you can write down notes or draw something you might learn. And then if you guys want to add and tag us and post it, we're happy to, and we're excited to see your art and your um, notes you might take or what you've learned from this program. You can connect with us at California State Parks Mendocino on Facebook or Instagram and also Ports Programs on Facebook and Instagram. And if you use the hashtag Ports Fan Art, then we're able to see your posts and your art and some stuff that you learn all right, back to the beach. What do you observe on this beach? What are those big logs of trees doing here? Well, this marine ecosystem connects miles back down Little River, through the river, up into the redwood forest, up to the pygmy forest. Turn this back. And then those logs wash down the river when there's huge storms of rain and end up on our beaches. So all these ecosystems like the forests, the wetlands, the estuaries, the sea caves, the sea mounts, underwater mountains are all interconnected, even connected to the intertidal zone, the tide pools, and the kelp forest. All these ecosystems host a wide variety of species, and those ecosystems and habitats protect those species and allowing them to inhabit and live there happily. And so in this marine protected area, MPA, have you guys, raise your hand if you've ever been to a marine protected area, know what it is. Awesome, got a bunch of hands. Thank you for responding. So marine protected areas are networks and they work as a network, as the charging zones for the ocean to replenish life, make it healthy and strong and make it more abundant. And then this, Recharging zone, the MPA, allows fish that have become so abundant to explore and move into other parts of the ocean and then make other parts of the ocean super healthy too. It's so amazing how this works. 
and we are so lucky to have the largest network of marine protected areas on our coast. So I'm going to show you a picture of where we are at. And hopefully, have you guys ever been to the Mendocino Coast? Or would you like to come? Let me give me one more second and going down, finding these awesome photos. All right, so here is a network of 124 marine protected areas. And where we're at right now is Van Dam State Marine Conservation Area. And then this photo shows you a little up close look of where I'm at. I'm on the north end of this beach right now, a little protected from the wind. And in this area, it, since it's a state marine conservation area, it protects the kelp, the intertidal zone, the geological artifacts, marine life, and all the organisms in it. With specific rules from CDFW, California State Department of Fish and Wildlife, allowing some recreational take and commercial take when the season is open. And so here is the Bay of Van Dam. Thank you guys. Make sure you lower your hands back down so that when I'm asking questions, you can raise them back up. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So here is the beach I'm at. And this is the State Marine Conservation Area just offshore. And just like our parks on land, we want to protect the resources and the, and the wildlife there. So this is an underwater wilderness park. Think of it that way. Like if you were to go scuba diving or snorkeling right now, you would be in an underwater kelp forest. Does anyone know what a kelp forest looks like? Raise your hand. Awesome. I got a bunch of hands. You guys are well versed. Let me show you one more picture. All right, so here is an underwater kelp forest. And there are many different types of algae in this kelp forest. One of the big ones we are protecting here is the bull kelp you see right there. And this is what it looks like when it's plentiful and there's a bunch of kelp and it goes all the way up to the surface. And here's some of the kelp you might find in the algae you might find in this kelp forest that feeds all the grazers. And what species do you think you guys might find here? Take just a moment, tell your neighbor next to you, your sibling, your mom, what kind of species you might find here? What kind of fish? What kind of grazers? What kind of predators would you find here? All right, I'm gonna give you a clue. On this next slide, you're gonna see some of the species you might find in the kelp forest. Have you guys ever seen these species before, these, these animals? We have the kelp forest over here on the top left. You'll see the bull kelp. Then you have a lingcod, just two below that, a sea cucumber. We have an abalone, which is the bottom left, second in. And then you have an urchin, that spiky ball. You see, that's an urchin. And then the sunflower star in the middle. These are some of the species you might find here. All right, now tell your neighbor next to you or write it down, which species or marine animal is your favorite? You guys got those answers? All right, hold on to them. We're gonna get to that in a moment. I'm gonna tell you guys my favorite marine animal. So what are the, some of the ways we can recreate here and play in these MPAs according to the rules just like parks on land, we gotta follow some rules. Just the wilderness parks under the sea, we gotta follow those rules to protect those animals and organisms. So I like to go fishing, spear fishing, diving, surfing, kayaking. There's some sea caves right around the corner I like to explore. And just a few years ago, I came up here and was coming up here to go abalone diving. Does anyone know what abalone diving is? A few? Yeah, you guys, you guys have been before maybe, maybe with your parents. Well, go swim out there, out to the kelp forest, dive down, 
find a big abalone, one about this size, the size of my head. And then use my gauge, my abalone by gauge, because underwater everything looks a little bigger. And make sure that it's of regulation size. And then I would be able to pick it off the rock and take it home. And they're really yummy and really good to eat. And this kelp forest out here used to be so full of kelp that it'd be hard to dive almost. You'd have to take a little dive knife with you to make sure you didn't get caught in the kelp. And so that you could find your way out. And if you did get a little snag or caught on something, you could cut it and be free and get to the surface and not worry about losing air or running out of air. This is what an abalone shell looks like. And this is one of the species you might find here in the kelp forest. So what are the species you guys wrote down of your favorite species? Favorite marine animal? Well, my favorite is the sea otter, the southern sea otter. And these guys are top predators in our kelp forest. They like to graze on out urchin, and they'll eat up all the urchin, and then clams and other small filter feeder animals and grazers. So this is one of the my favorite species and my favorite animals, the sea otter. But unfortunately in this area, back in the 1900s, they were hunted and scared out of this area to extinction. And they still are around in Southern California and Morro Bay, San Luis Obispo. But up here, they're no longer here because people used to hunt them for their pelts because their pelts were worth a lot of money. And so now we no longer have the otter up here. And that was a keystone species for our kelp forest. And why do we care so much about this kelp forest? What is important about it? Well, the kelp forest, you saw the picture where there's just kelp everywhere reaching all the way to the surface. Actually, I found one right now on the beach. It's really cool. And it has almost all the elements. So at the very base, you'll see this root system. And that's called the holdfast. And then this comes up this stem, the stipe, all the way up to this round thing. What is this called? Does anyone know? It's called a bulb. And this bulb is full of gas and air, and it pulls the rest of the kelp to the surface. And then it has blades of grass, grass-like blades, but they're a lot. They're thin, but pretty thick. And they reach the surface and collect the sunlight. And so that's how this guy grows, by photosynthesis. And so these guys are everywhere down there creating this kelp forest, not just one, but hundreds. And actually, I found a blade for you guys to check out, too. So this is what the blades look like. And they collect the sunlight and create energy to grow. And these are one of the fastest growing algae in the world. They grow two feet per day. And they need the right conditions. They need cooler water. They need sunlight. And they just need this calmer bay area sometimes too, because heavy wave action can dislodge them from their roots that they hold onto so tightly with the rocks and move them inshore. That's maybe one of the reasons this one is, was on shore and it's a little dried up. But these kelp, the forest, just like the canopies in the redwoods protect the life below, this canopy of algae and the kelp protects the life below, all the way from the grazers like abalone and urchin, maybe some crab or octopus, squid, moving up jellyfish and rockfish through the middle, and then all the way to the top. Then the otters lay on the top. That's where they stay warm because they're warm-blooded mammals. And all the way to the top, they protect a numerous amount of species and all this biodiversity. And so this kelp forest is so essential to our coast and to these animals. And so when we lost the the sea otter, like I was telling you about, that is a keystone species that helped create the balance within the ecosystem. And there's a few other factors that threaten this ecosystem. What do you guys think they are? What might be threatening our kelp forest? Scientists are calling it a combination of a perfect storm, different factors that are causing us to lose our kelp forest. 
Let me show you a photo. What our kelp forest used to look like and now what it looks like. So in this figure, you see at the top left, this is Van Damme State Beach, the one we're at right now. There's so much kelp, it's exploding on the surface. And then now, present day, like you see behind me when I remove this photo, you're gonna see there's no kelp and there's a little waviness and texture to the water. That's because the waves and the wind can bring waves in here now because that kelp isn't keeping it calm. That kelp acts like a buffer to the shoreline and protects the intertidal zone. And also the tide pools and protects it from wave action. And you can see as you go down what the forest used to look like, lots of life, lots of color, an abalone shell there, I mean abalone at the bottom there, hugging onto the rock. And then looking at the other side on the right, how there's a lot more urchins on the floor now. Why might that be? Why are there urchins all over the floor? Why is this grazer exploding in population and size? And then here's another picture of back in 2008, what our kelp forest used to look like, how much space it would take up, all that green zone you see there in the ocean is all kelp forest. And then now, in 2014, this is another diagram of how much kelp is left. And there's not tons of kelp left. It is kind of sad. Why do you think that is? Why do you guys think? And take a minute, think about that. Tell your neighbor what you might, why the kelp forest is a little dangered right now. Well, there's a few factors that cause this. So there's a perfect storm. And the reason all of this is happening. So back in late 2012, 2013, there was a die off of starfish called the sea star wasting disease. And sea stars are one of the top keystone species in our area too. So we have harmful algae blooms. We have warm water blobs, marine heat waves that roll through. Also a bit of climate change that's causing the ocean temperature to rise. And then the sea star wasting disease happened in 2013, causing a boom of purple urchin. And the, because the sea stars were predators for the urchin. And so sea stars eating the urchin, but then there's no more sea stars to eat the urchin. The urchin population starts to boom. And there's so many urchin, and they're taking up all the resources of the grazers and all the space. Here's a few pictures of what sea star wasting disease looks like. It's also known as a denzovirus that was caused likely by the warming ocean temperatures, marine heat waves. Um, causing this virus to become active and cause all these starfish to start lose their limbs and wash to shore. So it's pretty sad. And now the sea stars are slowly coming back into our ecosystem here in this habitat, but there's so many urchin that has caused a, a trickle effect, a little domino effect, as I might, you guys might think. And so I'm going to show you a little video, a short video of why these keystone species are so important and why they are balancing our ecosystem. So if you guys can imagine a Jenga set, And this Jenga set has different species all throughout and they act like building blocks. And so these building blocks are the keystone species. Thinking like, this is your habitat, your home. What would you need to keep the roof up? What are the building blocks of your house that help support everything and keep it upright? Maybe the walls, maybe the framing, the doors, 
The roof above your head is pretty important. So think of the keystone species like building blocks that if one wall or one building block was taken out of the Jenga set and it became a little unbalanced and then more were taken out, more were removed, all the sea otters were removed, then the sea stars started to become removed and less and less sea stars to control the urchin population. What, what do you think might happen? The Jenga set's getting really tall and all these pieces are being taken out. Well, if it gets too tall and unbalanced, it's gonna fall over, right? So what other species might be affected by the removal of these keystone species that help keep the balance and health in the ecosystem? Give you a moment to think about that. If you guessed abalone, you're right. Abalone have been harmed by this catastrophic turn of events and this perfect storm. Not only is the kelp no longer around because all these um, urchin are around and they're eating up all the kelp and maybe dislodging them because on the bottom of the floor where the hold fast, the kelp is holding on, the urchin are coming and eating up that food and then they don't have as many roots and then when waves come, they get lost and they get removed from the rocks and wash up on the beach. So who else eats this food? The abalone do. The abalone eat the kelp and that's their main food source. So when all of this started happening back in 2013, the sea star waste and disease, the increase in ocean temperature, and the ocean became a little more acidic too. So all these shelled creatures, are, it's a lot harder for them to grow and become strong. So I'm gonna show you a few shells here. So we have a bunch of really cool abalone shells, and some of them are because of this. We find these little shells, on our beach, this one's really small. Um, it didn't make it to maturity because there's not food for it to eat and they started to starve. And so this one's about two and a half years old. And then you get all the way up to this big guy. They have really cool colors on the inside due to the process of protein condensed and creating their shell. So these guys suck down the rock and they have a a foot right here that helps them hold on to the rocks and move around. One foot, kind of like a snail, all you see on land. Well, it is a, a marine snail. And so this one foot is not protected on this side either. So what do you think if the kelp forest goes away, more wave action happens, bigger storms happen, we get sometimes 15 foot waves coming through here on big winter storms then all the waves are crashing down on the abalone on the rocks and they get dislodged from the rocks. And because they're not protected on this side too, they're not only lower on food, but they're also getting beaten up by the waves. And so then they wash onto the beaches. So it's really harmful. And in 2018, our ab diving season, abalone fishery was closed because the lack of big um, abalone in our area and the fact that they're starving and there's the population is decreasing because there's overpopulation of urchin. Urchin look like kind of like this guy I showed you on the sea otter but here's a shell to give you a little better description of it. All these little bumps you see here are where the tube hundreds of tube feet come out of and how they move around also their spines the spiky things you see coming off of their shell. I'm going to give you a little anatomy picture of them. So that's what they look like on the inside. All that orange stuff is meat and gonads. And then you see the tube feet, the spines that come off of it. So the since there's an overpopulation of urchin, abalone aren't able to eat the food and they have had to move in closer and closer into the inner tidal zone where you see some of this green algae and kelp hanging out right here. We'll get a little closer in a minute. And so since that has happened and the climate change marine heat wave caused this perfect storm, our kelp forest is now endangered. It's threatened. Sorry, not endangered, it's threatened. 
and we have a lot less kelp and a lot less kelp forest on our coastline now. And this has caused not only a, a downturn effect for our ecosystem in the water, but it also affects us humans. The abalone fishery was a $44 million fishery for recreational fishing. So all the people, we used to have hundreds of people, hundreds of thousands of people come here every year for abalone season from around the world. And now that season is closed. And so the economy in this coastal town has gone down. So our local dive shop that's been around for 44 years is closed as well because there's no one filling up tanks, no one going ab diving, grabbing a mask from the store or fins to go diving. Also, this has affected our red urchin population too. The purple urchin have exploded and taken over and eaten up all these food and all the resources and competed for space. They outcompete all the other grazers. And so let me show you a quick photo of what an urchin baron looks like and why it is kind of a scary picture. So this is an overall population of urchin and what it looks like on low tide when all the water is rolled back out to sea. And here you see just one little abalone in the sea of purple urchins. And you can see how maybe that abalone that can't move as quick as the urchin can't get into the water when the tide is rolling out really quickly or the fact that he's so surrounded that there's not much food for him to eat either. So I want to challenge you guys, as we are working and scientists are working to help protect the kelp, help the kelp, um, what are other ways that we can help? How can you and I help protect this marine protected area as our ocean is such a great resource and a wealth of biodiversity? We want to protect these resources as they also are a part of our lives here on the coastal towns. So I want to give you just a few moments to think, how can you reduce your carbon footprint? Or what can you do to help support your public lands and also your underwater wilderness? Give you a few moments, maybe get out that pen, paper, write down a few things you might do, even everyday things you can do to help protect the climate change, make a positive impact. Okay, so if some of the things you wrote down was carpooling or bike riding to the store, ride sharing, maybe going to work with a friend, um, or just making sure that your space, your public lands are clean and what you bring in, you also bring out. And if you see trash on the beach, you pick it up. What are some other more important things you could do every day? Voting with your dollar. And maybe thinking about when you do have the chance to vote, voting for issues that help our environment. Reusing clothes, using buy trade sell stores to purchase clothes, and making sure maybe your next purchase is a reusable battery or one that's rechargeable. Those are all amazing things. Or even making sure you have your reusable cup, ditching the plastic, no more single use plastics, these are all amazing ways you can help your environment and also the world. As the ocean pr produces about 50% or more of oxygen for us, and that is a huge resource that we greatly depend on, just breathing. The ocean gives us that. So I want you guys to raise your hand. If you guys know any other ways you can help the ocean, write them down. How can you support your MPAs and make them brighter for the future? Yep, renewable energy. And maybe when you get that hand-me-down car or used car as your first one, that's actually helping the environment instead of buying a new one. Buying a fishing license is a great one. You help support the fisheries. CDFW, helping with educate yourself on rules and regulations of where you're at, what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do. 
as every MPA is different, different size, protecting a different ecosystem, different habitats for different marine life too. Some are state marine reserves where there's no take, no fishing allowed. And those are Uber charging zones. Maybe when you're walking through the tide pools, you just walk a little more gently because you don't want to step on a creature or a marine animal. And just make sure that when you're in there, you don't pick anything up. You, don't, you just want to observe and not touch. So I want to thank you guys. If you guys have any more questions, um, comments, or you guys want to draw something, you guys can do a little art challenge. Tag us with Ports Fan Art. Check us out on Facebook for more upcoming events, more ports programs. And if there's something I didn't get to, one of the questions I didn't answer, you might have missed, please reach out to us, ask your questions, and I'll find the resources to help answer them for you. Thank you again for staying happy, healthy, and at home during this time so that one, we can get back to all enjoying these parks very soon. All right, raise your hand if you guys want to go a little closer and see into the kelp for into the marine ecosystem we have here. All right, I got a bunch of hands. All right, cool. That is awesome. I'm excited you guys want to check it out. Let me just get this off here. Okay, how are we doing? Everyone see me? Connection good? Raise your hand. Cool. So we're gonna go a little closer, see some of the algae and all the different types we have here. It's a beautiful day. Thank you guys for coming and checking this out. We might even be able to see an abalone or an urchin over here. It's pretty low tide. One o'clock is the lowest tide. And I'm gonna walk mindfully, not to step on anything. Ooh, there's a little sculpin, little fish. How is the connection? Everyone can still see me, hear me? Raise your hand. Cool. All right, walking slow. Awesome. The other week I found an abalone right over here. See if I can see that again. There's a bunch more kelp right now, as you guys can see. Looking into the water. Beautiful marine life here. Can some of you guys identify what kind of kelp is around here? After going through those slides, there's so much kelp right now, I can't find the abalone. But that's a good thing, lots of food. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna walk back with hopefully without falling. <laughs> Thank you guys so much again for being here, joining me at Van Dam SMCA. And if you guys have any art, I'd love to see it. I really would. And, oh, wait, I think I found an abalone. Yes, I did. Are you guys excited? Who's raised your hand? Are you excited? Ready? This is a live abalone on the rocks. You can see right down here the foot sucking down onto the rock, holding tight. And if that 
abalone was feeling endangered by the waves or maybe a predator around, it would suck down onto the rock and flatten all the way down. Can you guys see that all right? Raise your hand. Cool, I'm gonna give you another glimpse. Lots of food around on this one. You can see the kelp and algae growing all over its shell. And that guy's pretty big. I'm impressed. Glad we found him. All right, I'm walking back. Find some anemones. Make my way back without slipping. This black stuff on the rock is pretty slippery. Okay, this way. Awesome. Thank you guys so much again for being here. It was awesome having you here. I hope you learned something new and maybe want to help the kelp in some way, help in, like remove your footprint from causing more greenhouse gases and help the climate change. Well, I hope to help be here with you guys soon in another home learning program. Have a great day.